very good evening to one and all and welcome to the last session for this month long series uh, the sixth lecture workshop on transdisciplinary areas of research and teaching by Shanti Swarupatnagar awardees and today we have with us professor Rajesh Kanapati from International Center for Material Science and School of Advanced Materials, Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, Bangalore. And he'll be talking to us today, the topic, Emergent Dynamics in Designer Active Granular Matter. And at the outset, I also would like to thank uh, the National Academy of Sciences, India Delhi Chapter, and the DBT Star College Program Scheme, which are funding this particular online workshop, apart from my host institution, the India Lopatia College. So Professor Ganapati is currently professor at International Center for Material Science, JNCSER, and he received in the year 2020, the Shanti Sarubhatnagar Prize for Science and Technology in Physical Sciences. And in the year 2016, the Swan Jayanti Fellowship in Physical Sciences from Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. His current research interests are soft and active matters, dense passive and active matters, nucleation and growth, soft matter on non-Euclidean surfaces, surface growth rheology of dense suspensions, stochastic heat agents. This small introduction, I would like now to invite Professor Kanpati to kindly share his screen and to deliver his talk. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, perfectly fine. Okay. Um, okay, at the outset, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Saxena, for this very kind invitation to be part of this uh, webinar series. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here and uh, tell you about some of the work that's been going on in our group. Um, uh, let me get the pointer on. Um, uh, for the really for the past uh, in, the, in the recent past, and um, the the video that you're seeing in the background are basically particles um, that are three D printed. Okay, and uh, uh, these are um, uh, these are a few millimeters long. So these are ellipsoids. These are a few millimeters long. And um, if you, uh, I don't know how well the video is playing at your end, but if you were to stare at the video for some time, you will see that there is a lot of collective motion that comes about in this sort of uh, uh, in this sort of assemblies. And um, uh, these particles are what I'm going to be calling as active particles. I will try to uh, explain all of that as we go along. And uh, and the, and the title of my talk is really about, uh, and the goal of my talk is to really convey to you uh, what sort of beautiful dynamics comes about in these sort of systems. Okay, um, so before I uh, get to the meat of my talk, um, uh, let me first uh, put on record the person involved in uh, all of these experiments. So that is uh, Ms. Pragya Arora. Uh, she came into my lab as a integrated PhD student, and now she's continuing on for a PhD. Uh, so everything that I've been, everything that I'm going to talk about, the design of the particles, the build, the apparatus that she built, and all the experimental findings are the work of one person. Um, I have this very long standing collaboration with Professor Sood uh, at IAC, uh, and uh, he's involved in all the stories that I'm going to tell you now. And of course, um, uh, last but not the least, I'd like to thank my institution, as well as the Department of Science Technology uh, for all the funding uh, that I've received so far. Okay, so before I get to the findings themselves, let me start with something that in my mind is a spectacular video, okay? So what you're seeing here are starlings, okay? In India, we call them the mina. Okay, and these are uh, starlings at dusk, and you see that uh, they are forming these beautiful patterns in the sky. Okay, and the first thing to note is the starlings themselves. You see, the range of the biological senses is quite limited, but these are patterns that are extending over kilometers. You know, the trees in the background are kind of a scale bar for you. Okay. 
So, uh, and um, uh, 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 the question, of course, is uh, where do these beautiful patterns come from? Okay, and this is not limited to Starlinks. Okay, uh, this is yet another video which I pulled off from YouTube. And uh, these are basically army ants. Okay, and these army ants, as you will see now, uh, are going around in a spiral. So these army ants are blind at birth. And uh, when they lose their pheromone trails, what happens is that they end up following each other and they inevitably form these sort of uh, patterns. And this pattern is going to persist. They're gonna go around in a circle until these ants die of exhaustion. Okay, so this is something that happens with army ants. And of course, humans are not out of the picture. So these are human beings at a, at a heavy metal concert. And once again, you see this sort of spiral form. You know, these are spontaneously forming. There is nobody guiding them and saying, go around in a spiral. This is something that just spontaneously forms when enough people um, uh, are excited enough. Okay. And uh, so I've shown you starlings, I've shown you ants, I've shown you human beings, all of them showing these sort of patterns, and especially the human beings. This was a study that was published in Fisrev Letter uh, uh, almost a decade ago. And it's not limited to these lens scales. These video again here that you're seeing is basically E. coli. Okay, these are bacteria that are seen under a microscope. Uh, these are part, these are bacteria that are motile, so they are moving around. And if you take a dense enough uh, collection of these bacteria, you once again see this sort of patterns emerge. And uh, and uh, you might have already seen this in numerous Discovery Channel videos in which you form these large fish schools. Okay, so all of these systems. Um, are, what, uh, uh, are what come under the umbrella of this term called active matter. And by active matter, all I mean is that there is, these are entities, these are agents that consume energy um, at the level of an individual particle, and it results in locomotion, okay? And importantly, all of these patterns that emerge that you've seen so far are not because of any central command that's telling you go around, form these patterns. These are just spontaneously forming, okay? So uh, what is active matter? These are particles that, uh, that are self-propelled and the direction of locomotion is set by the individual particle, not by a central command, okay? And um, um, it turns out that if you want to sort of model this sort of active matter system, then it just requires three rules. And those three rules were laid out by uh, Craig Grinalds in a, in a computer simulation that he came about in 1987. Uh, this is the simulation that you can just download on your computers and, um, and uh, you can just run your own simulations, okay? So that's very fascinating, right? And the so to see this sort of collective patterns, uh, Reynolds Im imposed just three rules. And the three rules are the following. First is to, uh, is to have a finite separation between the active agents. So it, it basically says, don't come too close, don't crowd too much, okay? So that is the first rule. So you need a finite separation between the particles. The second rule is if you have a bunch of neighbors headed in a particular way, so the lines are the heading of each of these agents, what you do is you point roughly in the same direction as all your neighbors are, okay? So that's basically saying steer towards the average heading of all your local flock mates, okay? And the third rule is cohesion, in which it also says don't go too far away from the flock, okay? Try to hang around close enough, but don't come too close, okay? If you just impose the three, these three rules and uh, run the simulation, you spontaneously see these sort of flocks emerge, okay? So this is basically a bunch of these active agents following these three rules. And you will also see very shortly uh, what happens if there are a bunch of uh, defects in the system. So these are like immobile, uh, those red spots are immobile uh, uh, obstacles. And you will see how these active agents, when they encounter these obstacles, they basically, uh, uh, they basically try to avoid it, they break and they coalesce, all sorts of things happen, okay? Um, now, it turns out that these precise three rules, you know, like you see the flock, you see the breaking of these flock clusters and all of that. 
these precise three rules were the ones that were used in this uh, in this movie called Lion King. And I'm sure that uh, many of you might have seen this movie. So this is, I think, uh, I forget the name, but I think that's Simba. And uh, this is uh, a wildebeest herd. That's uh, audio is far more wonderful than the one that I am talking about. Uh, but for some reason, the audio is not coming out on my computer. Uh, so you see this wildebeest herd, this wildebeest herd uh, uh, this animation was entirely done using these three rules. Okay, um, so um, uh, so the 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 key takeaway from everything that I've told you so far is that collective behavior emerges without obvious leaders or an overarching plan. It just spontaneously comes about in these systems. Okay, and uh, uh, active matter systems are fascinating because they are an exotic state of matter. By that, I mean, these are unlike your other condensed states of matter in which uh, there is a consumption, in which these systems are, active systems are perennially out of equilibrium because they are consuming energy at the level of a single particle and it's resulting in locomotion. Um, in fact, all of biology uh, uh, is, is active. You know, uh, the individual biological cell is an active broth. It has all these motor proteins inside. It has active filaments. All of these play a role in how cells locomote, how cell division happens, and so on and so forth. Active systems are fascinating because they lead, give you insights into pedestrian traffic and crowd control. There was this beautiful paper that came out in Nature by Tamas Rizek and co-workers in which they tried to model people escaping out of an uh, auditorium under panic, you know, and uh, they basically found uh, the, the, the behavior that you see in the simple model is what happens with real human beings. And uh, they also came up with strategies about how to avoid stampedes during panic. So, you know, that's once again, a classical active matter system. And, uh, and uh, 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 you have now uh, in the world of uh, self-driving cars and uh, robot swarms and all of that. And uh, studying active systems can give us insights into how to control these sort of machines or swarms, okay? So uh, that's what makes active systems fascinating. But then every example that I've told you so far are really not perfect for studying in the laboratory. You know, so if you want to do a controlled experiment in the laboratory, then how would you go about uh, studying uh, uh, active systems? Okay. So uh, the, um, the 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 rest of my talk is really going to be about uh, our way of trying to mimic active matter in the laboratory, and we're going to be using granules. Uh, so granular matter are basically particles that are in the millimeter size range. Imagine your basmati rice. That's a classical example of a granular system. Okay. So what we're going to do is in our experiments, we're going to do a very, very simple experiment. Okay. So this looks all fancy, but at the end of the day, all we're going to do is we're going to take these particles. We're going to take these granular particles. We're going to put them on a plate on a, on a, on a horizontal surface. And we're going to vibrate this horizontal surface uh, using a shaker. A shaker is, like I said, nothing but a fancy speaker. Uh, and um, and uh, we're going to image the dynamics um, of this, uh, uh, of what happens uh, from above using camera. And we're going to record all the videos, OK? And then try to decipher what's going on. So this is basically a schematic. And this is what the apparatus looks like inside our lab, OK? now. Um, so why does this experiment even work? Okay, so I'm, all I'm doing is I'm just taking grains and I'm shaking them. It turns out that, uh, okay, so before I go there, uh, so the vertical oscillations that I impose are going to be of the simplest form. These are going to be sinusoidal oscillations. And, uh, and uh, once I have this sort of sinusoidal oscillations, I can just take the derivative of this quantity twice. That gives me the acceleration. And the non-dimensional acceleration is just that acceleration that's divided by uh, the acceleration due to gravity, OK? Now, it turns out that if your particles, uh, be it whatever granules that you work with, have a small asymmetry in their shape 
or asymmetry in their friction coefficient. So imagine, uh, a, 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 imagine a particle in which one end of the particle has a higher friction than the, than the opposite end. Okay, And if you set these particles in vibration, what happens is that these particles tend to start becoming self-propelled. Okay, so these are two examples that I'm showing you, one from the Sooth and Ramaswamy group and one from the Olivier Dosho group in France. And what you're seeing here are, uh, are, uh, are granules uh, that are, uh, that these are disc-shaped particles, which have a small asymmetry in their friction coefficient. And these are rod-shaped particles, which have a shape asymmetry, okay? And you will see that in this system, Okay, uh, you just set it in motion and you saw this immediate flock formation. Okay, just so reminiscent of the Craig Reynolds rules. Okay, so this is a beautiful experiment that you can do in the laboratory now. All right, so uh, um, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of trying to understand what's going on, so the vibration that comes from the plate is like the nutrient or the fuel for these particles, but the direction of motion is set by the particle because there are no other fields, okay? And the direction of motion is set by the particle. So they meet all the requirements of what you would call uh, what comes under active matter, okay? Now, these are the sort of experiments that people have been doing so far, okay? Now it turns, now you might be very familiar with the fact that the particle shape, you know, uh, plays a very big role in the sort of physics that comes out, right? So if you really want to do a controlled active matter experiment in which you are able to tune activity, okay, the amount by which a particle moves or how fast it moves, okay, um, then you really cannot change the particle shape because changing the shape itself can bring about differences in the physics that you're trying to probe. So what we want to do is to try and keep the particle shape the same and still uh, try to tune activity, okay? And then see what sort of physics emerges, all right? So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be exploiting uh, 3D printing and uh, 3D printing no, needs no introduction to this audience especially. And uh, you know the number of things that you can uh, print um, these days, it's everything from uh, from heart walls to uh, aerospace parts, uh, prosthetics, all of this can be 3D printed, okay? We're going to use this sort of an idea and try to print active matter in the laboratory with the goal that we want to be able to make particles in which we are able to tune activity without changing the particle shape, okay? Um, uh, please stop me at any time if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer, okay? So, uh, so our uh, approach is going to be the following. I already told you that we, you need either a mass asymmetry or a friction, uh, mass or a friction anisotropy in the particle to give you self-propulsion. So uh, uh, we are going to start with uh, ellipsoids. So this is a particle that's 3D printed, okay? And just to tell you uh, what the particle's uh, dimensions are, it's about six millimeters long, three millimeters wide, and 2.3 millimeters tall, okay? And uh, this is basically uh, ellipsoid, which has neither friction nor mass anisotropy. But during the print process, what uh, Pragya has managed to do is to incorporate uh, a friction anisotropy. Okay, so the, the bright white patch that you see in this particle are basically, um, uh, is basically the rougher part of the particle. And that's why it's scattering more light and that's why it looks all white, okay? And over and above the friction asymmetry, we also have a hole that we print during the print process. Okay, so now you have a friction asymmetry between the front and the back of the particle and also a mass anisotropy between the front and the back of the particle. All right, uh, because we are doing 3D printing, we can print many, many thousands of these particles in one batch, all right? And we build a big enough tray uh, on which we put these particles. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and we can, you know, these particles are six millimeters uh, long, but we can go down all the way down to millimeter size particles. And you can still see that tiny hole, which is only a few hundred microns. All of this done using 3D printing, okay? And we can look at very, very large system sizes. So this plate can have as many as 50 to 60,000 particles, which allows us to probe really collective dynamics that is there, uh, that can come about in these sort of systems. 
Okay. So, so far, what I've told you is that you've just been able to incorporate a friction and a mass asymmetry. But the goal, of course, is to be able to tune activity. And to tune activity without changing the particle shape, you basically have to tune the extent of mass asymmetry. And we're going to do something very, very simple for that. Okay. So, we're going to print five different kinds of ellipsoids. Okay, and in each ellipsoid, the position of this hole is going to go all the way from the mid plane to one end of the ellipsoid. Okay, so as you go from this kind of particle to this kind of particle, what you're essentially doing is you're changing the extent of mass anisotropy. And there are two quantities that I'm interested in uh, when I'm trying to quantify activity. The first quantity, of course, is just the velocity of the particle itself. So, how fast it moves along a straight path. And the second quantity that I'm interested in is this quantity called as tau p, and that's the persistence time. By a persistence time, all I mean is, for how long am I going to keep the same heading? How long am I going to continue moving in the same direction? Okay, so these are the two quantities that I'm interested in controlling. Okay, so let us see if this sort of approach works in controlling activity. So I'm going to show you videos uh, of uh, all the five kinds of ellipsoids. And this is activity one. And you will see this is the particle with the hole in the center. And you'll see it is active. Okay, there are, it runs around for some time, then it turns, then it picks a different direction and then starts moving on in that direction. Okay, this is activity two, where the hole is kind of slightly shifted to one end. Okay, uh, probably the difference here is not too perceivable. But then this is activity three, four, and five. Okay. And just for the, and I am keeping all other experimental parameters constant. Right. I am keeping the angular uh, axle, I'm keeping the acceleration, the non dimensional acceleration constant, the particle shape is constant. Um, and you see that activity five particles are running around uh, 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 in straight paths that are much, much longer and they're also much faster as compared to activity one, okay? So uh, uh, so when my doctor came into the lab for the first time and saw these uh, particles, she called them walking basmati rice, okay? So I'm able to basically convince a 10 year old that, uh, that these are some form of active particles, okay? So, uh, uh, so these, I'm able to control activity and I like to just try and compare this with, uh, let me get out of the point of view. I'm going to now play you a video of what an E. coli bacteria looks like under a microscope. You can look at activity five and you can compare it with this video. And what you see is it's very, very typical. You have a straight path, the bacteria tumbles, picks a different direction, goes off straight. Okay, and my particles uh, that we have printed here are essentially mimicking this sort of behavior. All right. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Okay. So uh, to basically quantify this activity, um, uh, we're going to plot two very simple quantities. Don't worry too much about it. This is more to convince you that. Uh, the activity is really changing. I am plotting two quantities. One is called as the mean squared displacement um, as a function of time. And please note that all, you, all I want you to take away is that there is a change in slope. It goes from slope two. So you, this is a log log scale. So this is an exponent that I'm talking about. It grows from slope two to slope one. And wherever the crossover happens, the time at which this crossover happens defines the persistence time. Okay, because for ballistic motion, particles are essentially going to go along a straight line and the distance is going to go as t. So distance squared is going to go as t squared, which is the slope two here. Okay, and when they have enough collisions, when they have gone around enough tumbles, then it is going to look like a diffusive process in which the slope is going to be one. So this crossover from two to one defines the persistence time, which is systematically increasing as an increase activity. Okay, not only can I control the persistence time, I'm also showing you here the distribution of velocities. Okay, now as I go from activity one to activity five, you see once again that the velocity of these particles is also increasing. Okay, so the key takeaway from this slide is that using this sort of an approach in which we are able to encode a mass and a friction anisotropy, we are basically able to control uh, the activity in a very, very nice manner. 
Okay. Uh, so this is where we started off with, okay, a couple of years ago. Okay. Now I'm going to slightly change gears and introduce you to a slightly different uh, uh, characteristic that comes about in active systems, and that's got to do with chirality. Okay. Now uh, we all know what a chiral object is. Okay. So if a, an object is said to be chiral, if you have if the mirror image and the original image are not superimposable, okay? And a classic example of a chiral object is just the palm of your hand, okay? Now, um, uh, uh, the chirality, of course, is ubiquitous in all sorts of molecular systems. Your DNA, RNA, amino acids, all of these are chiral molecules. And um, um, uh, all of these in nature seem to have a preferred handedness. So the, one of the big questions is about why does nature prefer a particular handedness? It is still an open issue. And uh, uh, the, the object and its mirror image are called as enantiomorphs. okay? Um, and uh, the, the consequences of being chiral is very, very obvious, right? So you take, uh, 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 whenever you stretch out your hand to shake hands, uh, you always shake the same hand. You always stretch out your right hand or the left hand, okay? But if you have a right hand trying to shake hand with a left-handed one, it's going to be very, very clumsy, okay? The immediate consequence of being chiral is the fact that selectivity comes about, okay? Just the fact that you're chiral means you're also going to be selective in the way you interact, okay? And uh, this is not just with palms. Levocitrazine, which is a common uh, a common cough syrup that we take for uh, you know cold and uh, allergies, the level form of this molecule is is uh, uh, actually is the one that works. If you take the dextro form, which is the enantiomorph, it is completely useless. Okay, so this is once again selectivity coming about in 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 a, in a chiral molecule. Okay, and uh, uh, and uh, exploiting these facts, people now try to make uh, supra molecules. Uh, you might have heard about this from Subi George's talk a couple of uh, days ago, in which you try to make supra molecules and you put and you encode chirality in them so that you can bring about selectivity. Okay, but the key thing about the last two slides, whatever I've told you, is that chirality is a static property. What I mean is it is already encoded in the shape of the object, okay? There is nothing about it. Uh, uh, there is, uh, it, it, it completely is, uh, it, there's nothing, uh, it, it's fixed in time, okay? That's what I mean by that, okay? Now, it turns out that in nature, there are systems which are chiral active, okay? And by chiral active, I mean these are active matter systems that also have a handedness in the way they move around. And this was actually first reported by the scientist called Jenkins uh, almost 120 years ago, in which uh, he was uh, looking at uh, organisms in, in a pond, and he found that this particular organism called Loxidus swims around in a corkscrew fashion. Okay, it's got a particular handedness in the way it swims. All right, and if you take the E. coli bacteria and confine it to a surface, bring it near a boundary, you once again find that this particle doesn't go around in straight paths anymore, but rather has a well-defined handedness. It goes around in a circle, and the handedness of the circle is fixed. By handedness, I mean either it's clockwise or anti-clockwise. This is yet another bacteria in which uh, you can bring about, uh, uh, which is once again chiral active. And because of its uh, chiral active uh, nature, it forms these beautiful crystals, okay? Uh, uh, that, uh, that, that's come about uh, during the self-assembly process, okay? Now, uh, just like we want to mimic active matter, uh, is there a possibility of also mimicking chiral active matter? Okay. Now, once again, uh, people have been trying to use 3D printing to print chiral active matter. And uh, this is really not on the granular lens scale, this is on the colloid lens scale. But you will find that in these sort of systems, whenever a particle is chiral, it is also shape a chiral. Okay. This is the L shape, and this is the mirror image of, the, of this particular particle. Okay. So, what it means is that whenever you're trying to encode chirality in the activity, you're also encoding chirality in the shape, right? Now, if you want to probe the consequences of purely being chiral active, 
and you want to decouple the shape from it, uh, how do you go about doing that? Okay, and the bigger question that we want to try and address first is just like in systems with a static chirality, self-recognition comes about, can you also bring about recognition between chiral objects that are completely, that in which chirality is entirely in its, uh, in, in its activity, okay? So this is what we want to do. And uh, I've already told you how I can make particles in which I'm able to tune activity. Now the question is, can I also tune chiral activity, okay? So we're gonna start with the same good old ellipsoid. In the good old ellipsoid, you see this is the direction of forcing that I had because of a friction asymmetry. Uh, and that was the hole uh, which added an extra degree of forcing. Now all I'm going to do is I'm going to shift the hole, not, uh, not along the major axis, but along the minor axis. I'm going to shift it slightly off center. Now you'll see there are two forcings, one along the major axis and one that's slightly shifted. And what we would expect is because you now have an off-center force, you should now experience a torque. And now that torque should make a particle go around in a circle. At least that was the intuition, okay? And now to tune chiral activity again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the same old ellipsoid. The holes are in the same position, but during the 3D print process, I'm going to etch away the interior of the ellipsoid. So one half of the ellipsoid that you see here is hollowed out during the print process, okay? Now the question is, you see I have a whole bunch of ellipsoids and can I now control chiral activity? Okay, so let me show you a video. So these are actually particle trajectories that we get out from our experiments, okay? And you see that particle shape is held fixed, except now the handedness of the particle, uh, the radius of the orbits that it executes is very, very different. As you go from C1 to C6, please note down these, please just uh, uh, keep note of these uh, uh, um, uh, labels because I'm gonna be coming back to them again. Okay, so now we have ellipsoids in which 3D printed ellipsoids in which you are able to change. You see now these are ellipsoids that are going around in circles, not straight, okay? And this is one ellipsoid that goes around in a very, very large circular path, all right? So we are able to change uh, chiral activity without changing the particle shape. And now we're going to ask the question, can this sort of system, can there be stereoselectivity? coming about in these sort of systems, okay? And because we're doing 3D printing, uh, we can encode chirality in, 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 uh, in with other shapes as well, okay? Um, so let me tell you the experiment that we're going to do now. Now uh, you'll realize that there are two uh, handedness that I can have. These are particles that are in two dimensions. So I can either have a particle that goes around uh, clockwise or I have a particle that can go around anti-clockwise. So these are the enantial morphs uh, of each other, okay? And I'm gonna label them as a plus and a minus. And, and uh, one thing, of course, you will immediately realize is that the number of particles that I have on the plate is going to be an important parameter because you would imagine moving in the crowd. Uh, it is very, very hard to move because there are too many people surrounding you. Same is true with the particles as well. So the density of particles on the plate is going to be an important parameter. So that is something that I call phi, okay? And now because I have a chiral fluid or a chiral system, I also have to define for you the net chirality of the system. The net chirality is a very simple quantity. It is just the number of these clockwise spinners, number of anti-clockwise spinners, the difference between them by the total number of particles on the plate. Okay, so if I have a racemic mixture, it means that I have the same number of left-handed and right-handed particles. If I have an enantial pure system, it means that all I have are particles of a one-handedness. And uh, these are the two limits that I can have. And the enantiomeric excess will be in between these two limits. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these particles put them on my plate. I'm going to confine them from above. I'm going to confine them from above so that the particles cannot rotate and change their net chirality, okay? And we're going to have, we have all these custom written codes in our lab in which once we see videos like this, we can track the individual particles, we can track their orientations, and we can pull out meaningful numbers. 
Okay. Um, so uh, let me tell you what happens. Uh, so this is something that uh, through a surprise that we didn't quite anticipate. Before I uh, go further, I'd like to tell you these are just plastic particles. There are no attractive interactions between them. All right. So let's see what happens if uh, I have a, a plus and a minus particle. Okay, so these are the particles with a suitably small radius, uh, which I'm calling C2, C2, okay? What you see is the following, okay? These are two particles that have spontaneously come together to form a dimer, okay? And like I said, there is no attractive interaction between them. It's purely mediated by activity, all right? And, uh, 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 and why do they form the mover state? It's very, uh, I don't know how many of you are action movie buffs like me. So if you've seen in movies in which there's a car that's trying to turn left and there is somebody chasing and trying to turn right, when they collide, they end up going straight. And that's precisely what's going on here, okay? So now we can do this sort of experiment, not just with C2, C2 particles, we can do it with all the pairs of particles that we have. And I'm going to define a, a time called as the lifetime of the dimer, which I'm calling as the mover lifetime tau. And you know that if the two particles are uh, having a very large active torque, so they're executing very small turns, those are the particles that will be very, very long lived. And that's what we find in our experiments, okay? So the particles that exert the largest torques on each other uh, are not surprisingly paired for the longest amount of time, okay? So these are particles that have a opposite handedness. There are plus and a minus, okay? Something very fascinating happens if I take particles of the same handedness, if I take two of them of the same handedness, what I see is a spinner state, okay? So these are particles that are not moving around like the dimer did, they just stay in position and they just start spinning about an axis, all right? And uh, once again, uh, the, for the spinner state to exist, you see the monomers, the individual enantiomers cannot slide past each other. And that condition is met. You can do a simple geometry calculation and show that that condition is met only for small enough radius. So this is just a table that shows that for C1 and C2, you get both these spinners and movers. Whereas for the C3, C from all the way from C3 to C6, all you get are the mover states. Okay, uh, Manoj, how am I doing on time? Okay. Oh, we are we are perfectly uh, on time. I think uh, we still have about fifteen minutes or so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So, uh, so they form these sort of uh, spinner states. Okay. Now the question is: um, uh, uh, Is there also recognition? So there is clearly uh, the fact that they are pairing. So there are clearly interactions are coming about due to chiral activity. But can I also? Is there also recognition between the particles? By that I mean. Will the C2 particles recognize the C2 particles in a mixture of C2 and C4 particles? Okay, so we're gonna do that experiment as well. Okay, so we're gonna start with uh, different combinations. Okay, we're gonna start with, uh, with uh, uh, C2, C2 uh, move uh, with, a, with the opposite handedness. We're gonna measure the lifetime of such a pair. We're gonna look at a C4, C4, uh, uh, dimer of the opposite handedness, and we're also going to measure the hand in, uh, the time scale over which the dimer state survives of a C2 and a C4, okay? So, and you see that C2 and C4 have very, very different radii, okay? So let me play this video now. This is C2, C2. It's a very, very long-lived dimer, okay? This is C4, C4. You see that the dimer breaks quite frequently, okay? And this is C2, C4 the dimer breaks even more frequently, okay? So we can do this experiment a few thousand times, oh, sorry, a few hundred times is what we did. Um, and we can measure the lifetimes of these pairs, all right? And stereo selectivity would mean that C2, C2 and C4, C4 are longer lived than C2 and C4, okay? And that's precisely what our experiment shows. You know, C2, C2 lives for about 14.8 seconds, 14 seconds on an average, C4, C4 for three seconds, and C2, C4 for 1.4 seconds, okay? So now I have this really boring piece of plastic particle. It just looks like an ellipsoid, 
except it is chiral active. And just by imparting it with chiral activity, we've been able to bring about selectivity in the way these particles are interacting, okay? Uh, so what I've done is I've looked at the very dilute limit. So now what I'm going to do is to go to the much uh, denser limit. And now, like I said, uh, in the dense limit, uh, the phi is the control variable. So that's the number of particles on the plate. And once again, I'm going to look at uh, these, uh, uh, I'm going to look at these chiralities, okay? Now, you know that if I have an energy of pure liquid, it means I have only the spinner states. If I have a racemic mixture, because I have particles of both the handedness, I'm going to get both spinners and movers. And in between, I'm going to get a slightly excess number of spinners over the movers, okay? And what you would think is because these particles have very, very, these dimer pairs have very, very different dynamics, you would expect that even if I kept the density constant, even if I kept phi constant, you would expect to see changes in the physics, okay? So let me play this movie for you now. This is chi equal to zero. This is chi equal to 0.5 and this chi equal to one. Probably it is not very evident in the movies here, but then what we can do is we can quantify the time it takes for the system to relax, okay? And by relax, I mean the time it takes for a particle to move its own diameter, okay? And what you find is that, uh, don't worry about the indices here, uh, it, it just stands for the rotational degrees of freedom and the translation degrees. I have an ellipsoid. It can both rotate and translate. So I'm quantifying relaxation times in both degrees of freedom. What you find is even if I keep the density fixed, I can have a slowing down, a slowing down because the time scale to relax is going becoming longer and longer just by changing the net chirality. Okay. Um, and uh, these are videos that you see. Uh, you know, we have just digitized them and the particles here are color coded based on how much they move. And what you find is as you go from chi equal to zero to chi equal to one, once again at a fixed density, the nature of dynamics that you see is very, very different. Okay. So um, uh, the key takeaway uh, and you, one, one thing that one can do is once you have these sort of clusters, by cluster I mean all the particles that are moving collectively together, I can quantify the size of these clusters. We have algorithms again to do that. And once again, you find that just changing the net chirality changes the nature of, sorry, changes the number of particles that participate in a collective, uh, in, 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 in a collective behavior, okay? And you see that it grows, right? So this is all with chiral active particles. Now, uh, in the last five minutes or so, what I would like to tell you is uh, we're going to go back to the original system in which I had these particles, which are achiral, right? They are just moving along in straight lines. They're going to tumble and then take a turn and go along in a straight line. Let us see what happens if I take dense assemblies of these systems, OK? And the question that we're going to ask is, what happens how does the system slow down, okay? Now, just to give you a little bit of background, um, uh, we all know what happens if you take a liquid and start cooling it down, right? When you start cooling down liquid, uh, your, uh, your particles are going to move slower and slower, and eventually there is going to be, uh, at, uh, at the freezing temperature, you're going to go from the liquid state to, to the crystalline state. That is only if, if the cooling is done slowly enough, okay? But if you cool the system fast enough, what happens is that this system will turn into a glass, okay? It doesn't have time to rearrange into a nice crystal. It just gets kinetically arrested into this disordered configuration, which we call a glassy state, okay? Now, uh, you can take any material known and you can drive it into a glass. Okay, not it's true with atoms, molecules, polymers, colloids, all sorts of systems can be driven into a glassy state. Okay, now the important thing about the glass uh, or the dense liquid state is because particles are so tightly packed, the only way you can move is if you dislodge a few of your neighbors. Imagine moving in a very, very crowded place. You will get to move only if few neighbors of yours also cooperatively move along with you. Okay, so although the system looks disordered and looks just like a liquid to the eye, the dynamics in the system is very, very cooperative. Okay, and this is something that our group pursues in a different context. Okay, but everything here that I'm telling you about 
is for dead matter. By dead matter, I mean conventional matter. Okay. And um, about uh, 10 years ago, there was this beautiful paper that came about in which they said that even if you have living, so this is basically the, <coughs> the video that you're seeing are basically uh, a confluent sheet of cells. These are living cells. And they basically found that many of the dynamics that you see in this sort of systems are reminiscent of the glassy physics that you see in dead matter. Okay, uh, and what we wanted to do is uh, basically ask the question, how does activity affect the glass transition? Okay, now you would think that if I have a bunch of particles and I put an activity into the system, which means I'm putting in energy at the level of a single particle, you would think that the system should become more and more liquid-like because I'm putting energy, I'm putting energy for them to move and rearrange. Okay, so this is essentially the question that we're going to ask, and we're going to ask this with our very control system that we have. Right, so uh, this is once again a chiral active particles. These are at five different activities that I'm showing you, and these are once again the density is constant, but here the activity is changing. All right, and of course, what you find is that uh, even it's visually striking that the particles with the highest activity are tending to form these sort of clusters whereas the particles with the lowest activity are more homogeneously distributed across the plate, right? So once again, there are no attractive interactions in the system. This is a clustering that comes about purely due to activity, okay? So let me tell you why it happens. The reason this happens is the following. Imagine that there are two active particles rushing towards each other purely by happen happenstance. And if they were to collide, you know that because the velocity vectors are all aligned for a particular time, tau p, until the velocity vectors randomize, this pair is going to be stable. It is almost like an attraction that you would see in, in dead matter, okay? And, uh, and as this cluster forms, if another particle comes, that particle is going to slow down. It leads to a positive feedback. And you know, in experiments on active matter, so these are synthetic experiments, these are, uh, oh, sorry, um, uh, these is, this is in, uh, in, in, in a particular class of bacteria. In all sorts of active matter systems, you see this sort of clustering come about purely due to activity and not due to, uh, not due to any attractive interaction, okay? So we see this sort of behavior even in our plastic ellipsoids. All right. Now we can go to the very high density because we are interested in asking what happens to the liquid at very high densities. And what we find is something quite fascinating. We have done these experiments with the same uh, ellipsoids, but dead ellipsoids. And we know that at this area fraction of 80%, the system is completely frozen into a solid. Okay, we have done these experiments and we reported it a long time ago. But when, you, when these particles are active, you will see that there's a lot of cooperative motion happening at the same density. In fact, even at higher densities, we see this sort of activity, okay? Uh, so the system is really not getting into a glassy state. And the question is, why is it that a system that's so tightly packed, not freezing into a glass, all right? Um, so, uh, uh, so what we did is to basically uh, look at uh, defects in the system. So because I have elongated objects, there are two classes of defects that are expected in such systems. One is called as a plus half defect. By that, I mean, if I take an ellipsoid, go around in a circle, the angle picked at the end of one complete rotation, that's basically the sign, the magnitude of the defect, okay? I can either have a plus half defect or a minus half defect. And it turns out that in active matter, these defects are motile, okay? The plus half defect is motile, whereas the minus half defect tends to be stationary. And it's simply because of the way the orientation order field looks around each of these defects, okay? Now we go back to our glassy uh, samples and ask why is the system not freezing? And what we find is, let me play you this video. So you see that is a plus half defect that just moved. Uh, that is a red dashed line. There was a plus half defect that moved, whereas the minus half defect tends to be stationary. And that is exactly where the system is also having these sort of collective dynamics. You know, I told you about these heterogeneous dynamics that are there in dense fluids. We see this sort of heterogeneous dynamics in precisely the regions where there's a plus half defect. And these plus half defects that are motile are unique to active matter. 
Okay, so these sort of Plasov defects are acting as source for these heterogeneities, letting the system relax and then suppressing the formation of a glassy state. Okay, so the system stays fluid even if you go to very, very high densities. All right, so with that, I would like to conclude and I'll tell you that, uh, the, you know, bringing in 3D printing in active matter uh, uh, allows you to control activity in a very, very fine manner. And you know, there are numerous theoretical predictions. I didn't have the time to go into the details, but uh, what we do in our lab is to essentially check these sort of theoretical predictions against these sort of controlled experiments. And, uh, uh, the, uh, and active matter is at the interface, as you will realize, of physics, biology, engineering, sociology, and even art. And I would like to leave you with this beautiful photograph. Uh, this is by, uh, uh, by this person, Javi Bo. And what you're seeing is a time-lapse image of birds flying in the sky. And you see this beautiful patterns form, okay? And this he calls as ornithography. Ornitho because it's birds, art made by birds, okay? With that, I'd like to thank you. And uh, if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer. Yeah, thanks, Professor Rajesh, for enlightening us about a whole new branch of uh, science. I'll say really, truly interdisciplinary, where you have mixed up. Uh, I mean, the last concluding slide, I really appreciate that we do visualize things, but sometimes it it is something which is not apparent to us. So that's yeah. that's great. Yeah. Sure. I, I, I've got just, just two questions uh, yeah. related to it. I think maybe from one of the students or one from a faculty member. Yeah. So the first one is, uh, what do you mean by odd viscosity in chiral active matters? Okay. Um, it is a little hard for me to explain it immediately in this context, okay. but the fact that um, um, uh, the, the, uh, let me collect my thoughts. The fact that these particles are now going around in a circle means that your strain tensor has those um, elements that are off diagonal also, and that contributes to the odd viscosity. Okay, um, uh, I can't tell you anything. In, uh, I need to really think about how to put it in a very simple manner, which I don't have an answer immediately to. Um, yeah. Okay, no problem. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just move on to the next one. Uh, you explain uh, things related to mortality. So what yeah. is mortality induced phase separation? Okay, and, uh, so um, the mortality induced phase separation, the one that I... Um, uh, let me go to the slide, uh, if I can uh, get there. Okay, one second. Okay, so, um, so here what I'm talking about is, you see, I have two particles that are, uh, that are uh, essentially uh, being driven towards it, they just spontaneously or just randomly come towards each other. And when they come towards each other, they form this sort of a cluster phase. They, they've come together and you know, until the velocity vector is randomized, they're going to come together and they're going to stay bonded. And in the meantime, if another particle comes and joins this cluster, uh, joins this dimer, it's going to slow down the dynamics even further, right? So what happens is these are motility induced clusters because these are clusters coming about without any attractive interactions. And if enough, and if you're working with enough at enough density, what it means is that these clusters can grow uh, in, in, in size. And you have this, you know, this picture here in which you have a dilute gas phase and a dense liquid phase. So that is a phase separation that comes about without attractive interactions purely due to motility. Thank you. So these are the two questions which I have yeah. received. I was just checking the chat. Uh, there were no further questions in it. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Ajesh, for yeah. uh, sparing your valuable time. And on behalf of the National Academy of Sciences, India thank Delhi you. Chapter, and the host institution, the Indian College, I would like to thank you once again.
I would like to thank all the attendees who have been there with us for today's session and all the attendees who have been there with us for the last one month. And it has been a very pleasant journey for all of us where all of us have been immensely benefited by the technical talks, contributions, research, work shared by the experts in last uh, four weeks and all of them leading experts and hope to see you all again in some of the future programs which we plan to organize uh, in the month of April onwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.